We're now going to move on to uh, Dr. Ira Leifer. Um, Ira's got a long history of working uh, with OSPR on various projects over the years, uh, like determining uh, flow from abandoned wellheads out at the old Summerlin field. Um, boy, that was a long time ago. Anyway, uh, it, you know, if you if you need information on the Santa Barbara seeps, uh, I, I would recommend Ira as a, as a world class expert on uh, on seeps and and specifically the bubbles, the uh, the oily bubbles coming from those seeps. Ira has his own company, Bubbleology, and he's going to talk to us today. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, Oil remote sensing with the disaster management cycle for chemical release disasters. Ira, it's all yours. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And I can see. Try to get it so it does the whole thing. Okay, uh, so I had plans to discuss thermal infrared quantitative oil thickness remote sensing. And sometime last week, I gave up on getting legal permission to discuss that. So I'm going to give a 30 million meter view from, well, 30,000 kilometer, whatever, orbital view of oil spill remote sensing within the disaster management cycle. And down below you, in the background, you can see a oil slick off of Santa Barbara. Um, okay, here's the disclaimer. I took this from all over the place and don't sue me for it. So let's start off with a uh, disaster. So um, this kind of brings to mind the um, statement by Justice Potter Stewart. You know it when you see it, but it's not so easy to define because you know, a technical is when a hazardous event becomes a disaster and exceeds the responding agency's capacity resources to respond to it. A magnitude six earthquake in Japan is not a disaster. A magnitude six earthquake in Haiti is. And this is kind of quite telling because it means that we socially determine whether or not some disaster is a disaster or not. Social means political, everyone's favorite aspect. And politics doesn't occur in a vacuum. So I came across this, it's rather interesting comparison of what happened in hurricane versus non-hurricane states in terms of inequality. And unsurprisingly, this is kind of, we know from our history in the last decades, things get less equal or the benefits are, and the costs are not shared very well from disasters. I was unable to find any similar studies related to oil spill disasters. You know, and oil spill disasters are one of many types of disasters. You know, if you look at this list, you realize this planet is a pretty dangerous place to live on. And Oil spills are a natural disaster um, and technical, a chemical release. And, but I'd like to point out that often disasters can cascade. So an earthquake can lead to an oil spill as can a flood, as well as radiation. Fires can combine with earthquakes to cause an oil spill. So oil spills do not always occur as just a oil spill disaster. And the implications are widespread and long. You know, here's a chemical release and there's health uh, to people who are exposed, also to responders. Um, I'm moving kind of quickly, I'm gonna slow down in some other slides. Um, oil is one of the, um, is a, Okay, so as a uh, seep person, um, I had this saying that I came up with, which is, I love the smell of seep oil in the morning. It smells like science going out every week to observe and do experiments in the Santa Barbara seep field. Um, maybe that wasn't the healthiest choice. Uh, it's natural. 
but it's also one of the most complex and toxic uh, substances. It's very useful, but it's also quite persistent. And it also is damaging in that not just the toxicity can affect wildlife, but also smothering and loss of uh, heating and so on. So in this regard, you know, it's a very challenging place to do studying, any doing anything on the ocean. It's also extremely complex physically and chemically because it occurs at the intersection of the atmosphere and the ocean, which are always changing and which are always changing. And it also extends into both of <coughs> these, uh, these bodies. <coughs> In addition, <coughs> Inf because it is so changeable, the information is very time sensitive. Its value decreases with time rapidly. And <clears throat> this though is in common with many other disasters where emergency management has shifted to the disaster management cycle. And this is where oil spills are part of this we're at this workshop in preparedness, hence locating ourselves. This cycle <clears throat> is used on for managing uh, disasters and attempts to reduce the cumulative damage from the disaster. And that means improving response, but also decreasing the occurrence and also improving mitigation and recovery which are dependent, among other things, on resiliency of the ecosystem and the communities. And in all of these, because of this time sensitive, because, uh, remote sensing can help. Um, remote sensing, what is it? Well, we look generally, with the exception of active systems, like SAR uses a broad spectrum of wavelengths uh, of light to observe remotely the oil on the sea surface, uh, as well as vegetation and other aspects. Uh, but within what looks like a beautiful prism and spectrum, there are many defects or absor molecular absorptions. And it turns out that petroleum hydrocarbon has molecular absorptions in the infrared, which can be used to be diagnostic. That means when you detect them, you know it's petroleum hydrocarbon, not a false positive. Okay. Um, you know, one of the uh, basic important, of a pr important roles of remote sensing is the detection uh, of which can be done in primarily a SAR, but also is done in the visible. And this uh, can then cause a response to occur. Um, and different parts of the remote sensing uh, see oil differently. Uh, the tiger tail looks very different in SAR than it does in the visible. And based on where the oil is, and to another extent, how much is there, you can allocate resources. Um, so I was putting together this talk I looked through my old talks to OSPR and I realized for a decade now, I've been showing the same avarice, oil thickness, remote sensing. I'm a decade older and nothing is new in this area. Um, it's just kind of waiting, I guess, for another oil spill to occur for things to move forward. I'm just going to point that Merv has a great paper on the holy grail of oil thickness and how difficult it is and move on. Um, you know, during the recovery phase, uh, the effort is on general and the res restoration of systems, uh, though this is a period when many drivers of disaster uh, also occur and remote sensing can certainly help. Um, for example, it uh, can be used to map ecosystems. And again, this is both avarice and, and um, looking at different vegetative indices 
and on and using them within Landsat to identify um, areas of oiled uh, vegetation. And this can be used both to track how um, the recovery process is going, to direct uh, resources in certain directions and so on. There are many uh, important benefits, especially in a tidally changeable area such as Louisiana uh, bays, but also in inaccessible areas such as the Arctic. Um, this in a similar vein shows how different vegetative indices are uh, quite promising. This is using Landsat data, so you don't have to have a avarice instrument to use remote sensing to aid the recovery and restoration. Um, but you know, there are also many drivers of disasters. And this is kind of the standard disaster science, um, usually uh, envisioned as, um, okay, let, let me, uh, so for example, you want to, as part of the cycle, modify behavior with incentives, regulation, enforcement, improve resiliency. This is part of the management which might uh, provide uh, economic cushions within community structures to support uh, response and recovery from a societal or an ecosystem point of view to a disaster. Training, we've been seeing about monitoring and warning systems, environmental sensitivity indices. And these are all, um, uh, these are all things that remote sensing can help. And unfortunately, there are also many drivers of disaster. Uh, this is usually envisioned as a global south problem. Haiti is a particular example where degradation of the ecosystem, loss of resiliency in communities, poor incentives, and so on, can lead to enhancing the disaster and the damage. Um, unfortunately, after Katrina, Sandy, COVID, even the storms that are occurring in Texas right now, uh, this is the new new that we live in here in the States. And disaster drivers are the difference between the plan, the theory, and the application, because the application is where reduced trust in, in institutions causes problems, degradation, resiliency, all challenge, bureaucratic uh, issues, and so on cause problems. And again, those are institutional capacities. Um, you know, and in, in these regards, we see a lot of this in um, you know, how we try to do the job within the system that we have. Um, you know, many of these modifications of behavior uh, can be coming from uh, Wall Street or other places. And you know, there are also uh, problems associated with poverty and so on that I've discussed. Um, also, should mention that these different phases are not discrete. They intermix and that um, improvements in the response speeds the recovery. Uh, efforts to improve training and public education can help with preparedness and the recovery by reducing the damage and having stronger community systems to recover from uh, the disaster. Um, similarly, uh, many of kinds of preparedness obviously also improve. So diff remote sensing, if it's integrated into the response can help with preparedness, but it has to be integrated into the response. I'm going to provide some examples of, of how this can be. Um, from Deepwater Horizon, uh, LIDAR data collected by the Army Corps was able to observe 
uh, the dispersion of oil into the upper water column. So this is an approach where remote sensing could be used to evaluate the efficacy of a response approach and then use to improve activities on the further day or the protocols being used by to display to uh, release to apply dispersants or in the other cases uh, collecting oil recovery and this is also from Deepwater Horizon this was avarice and if we look here we can see um, a uh, standard oil boom configuration with oil just spilling out the back uh, this information had it been available in real time to the boat operators could have uh, encouraged them to slow down, <laughs> don't spill the oil. Um, and so this is another way in which remote sensing can, could be integrated into the response, but this would aid preparedness and as well as collecting data to improve how it's integrated into future oil spills. Uh, we met, I mentioned M's, um, incentives, and I think one of the best uh, examples of how to provide um, effective incentives is from EMSA and uh, the Clean Sea Net, which has a, a very high density of coverage um, around European coastlines and in the Mediterranean. Uh, they detect um, using SAR and other satellite data, uh, oil spills, and then attempt to, not to notify ship operators within uh, 30 minutes to three hours. Um, and as a result, the, which you can see on the right, the amount of oil spills, possible spills detected um, per year has been decreasing. 2016, it increased because of Sentinel-1, which is much more sensitive. So this is where the integrated approach of warning and um, I guess citations, or at least warning, warning to uh, the regulators, the EMSA, which then provide warning to vessel operators, is, greatly decreased uh, oil damage in the ocean. Um, and in addition, it can inform um, guidance for shipping lanes. So uh, looking at um, the probability, the red is kind of thing. There are certain seasons where oil is more likely to be a problem. These follow the shipping lanes and unsurprisingly, um, they're also in areas where oil is more problematic. Um, so to kind of conclude, in disaster science, emergency management has shifted to disaster management to improve the resiliency and shift disasters to becoming hazards that are easily addressed. Remote sensing is very helpful and time response is critical. And just a reminder of why the effects are long term on the community, as is inequality. I have two minutes for a very small commercial break. Um, uh, we have developed a package here, Bubbleology, for air quality uh, measurements called Sister that I can put in my pickup truck or on a boat. We have driven it through the seep field, but again, the results of that are not ready, are not cannot be publicly disseminated at this point. Um, we measure 13 gases, aerosols, uh, radiation, um, as well as GPS, and we can collect uh, air samples. Uh, one of the applications we use on this is to look at how the air in Los Angeles at the ports is dramatically cleaner in due to COVID. This is a health study, which is one of the applications. And uh, we collect samples uh, targeted. So this is near the Phillips 66 refinery, which is in white. And we can analyze with our partners at Irvine, 100 different compounds. Here we're showing one visualization approach 
to methane through undecane and where the color, the pinkness relates to the alkenes and alkynes. So this is a way of fingerprinting uh, sample 4215. It's one that was uh, uh, emissions or a plume shown in methane from the refinery. Um, 4214 uh, is one from the background and just represents Los Angeles. Uh, note that the concentrations other than methane are in parts per trillion. And uh, I see I have 30 seconds left. So uh, any questions, I'm happy to take them. Oh, but this could be used in oil spill to look at uh, response to workers and uh, communities and, and so on and health issues. Okay, here, here's a quick, a quick question. Have you ever been stopped by law enforcement while driving that pickup truck around? Surprisingly, no. Although when I did this with an RV around refineries in L in Los in Louisiana, I did get held up for a few hours while I convinced a Louisiana sheriff that I didn't have an atomic bomb in the back of my RV. <laughs> okay.